you know, there, believe it or not, there's only two conferences this entire academic year that are going to be in person. And one of them happened to be the 22nd annual FSU Sport Management. So, so, so give yourself another round of applause. Trying to talk to science. And, and at the end of the day, when you don't have sport to play, we don't have jobs, right? So this is an opportunity for you to really take advantage of those opportunities. First, I want to um, say thank you, Dr. Give, give it up for Dr. Flanagan. Give, give it up for her. She's amazing. She is the brains behind all of this. The structure, the organization. To, to put us in a position to have this. And again, it's all run by students. And, and with that being said, I want to say thank you to all the volunteers. It's a tremendous job. We had over 60 something. Sadie, thank you. How many volunteers we had? A lot. A lot <laughs> to make it happen. And, and for that, I want to say thank you. In addition to, you know, one of the things came about cost. You know, at the end of the day, I, I know, you know, cost is something that, you know, Pat, you know, why do I have to pay $55? Why do I have to pay this? You know, the reality is this. You get to hang out with us, number one, that's, not, that's priceless. But number two, you get to go to Township tonight. We have some food, we've got lunch tomorrow, we've got breakfast for you tomorrow, we've got drinks all day tomorrow, we've got obviously your gift deals and all that. But more importantly, you're gonna hear some of the top professionals in the country about the industry to help you understand what it takes to get to where they got, hopefully, or to figure out, you know what, I don't know if this is something I wanna do, but I wanna do this. And, and during our internship fair, which we'll talk about throughout the night and throughout tomorrow, take advantage as well. Um, but, but I think for the most part, I want you to participate. I, I can't stress enough, anything you do in life, and particularly as you know in internships, what you get out of something is what you put into it. And so tonight is a perfect example to make, take advantage of those opportunities. Um, we haven't had the conference in two years. And we were, we were having some tremendous momentum up until COVID hit. And we had to cancel this conference twice. And finally, for the first time, we were able to have it here in the spring of 2022. Normally, we would have it in the fall. So take advantage of this, because you don't know when opportunities present itself. This conference was designed for you, for you as students, to understand what it takes, but more importantly, hopefully get an internship. Hopefully meet your classmates. Hopefully meet somebody in an industry that you never thought in a million years you'd be a part of. So, so I, I take each and every one of you to challenge yourself to make sure you meet someone new each and every time, tonight, and tonight, tomorrow, and throughout the day of the conference. Hopefully you'll make some connections for the rest of your life. So with that being said, you better ask good questions, all right? We've got, we got the friggin' the best friggin' director of football operations, not just intercollegially, but I'm talking the friggin' NFL, MLB, NHL. We've got Mr. Brandon Roth, a graduate of our program back in 2009. He's been with six different head coaches, 13 straight years with one organization with the Jacksonville Jaguars. That right there in itself is friggin' amazing. But before we do that, I'd like to turn it over to our MC for tonight. Alex, please give a round of applause. Hi, guys, and welcome to the 22nd Annual Sport Management Conference right here at FSU. Before I get started, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Alexandra DiCaprio, and I'm honored to be your MC for the next couple of days here. I was born and raised in Las Vegas, Nevada, and moved to Jupiter, Florida for in-state tuition, which found me right here at Florida State, where I majored in media communication studies, um, pursuing a career in sports broadcasting. We don't have a journalism program here, but we do have one class called Advanced Feature Production and Reporting. In my third semester of that class, I was assigned a feature on the number one sport management program in the country, which led me to Dr. Bapps's office. And that was just over a year ago, and now I am blessed and privileged to be standing in front of all of you today. So I am just so excited to be here and appreciate it, and I hope you guys all feel the same. Um, first, I'd like to thank Dr. Pappas, Dr. Flanagan, and the amazing volunteers that have worked for months to prepare this right here tonight and tomorrow. I want to hear it for them right now. I want to thank our speakers and our vendors who have traveled here, taken time out of their busy schedules to be here for us. We are so excited to hear from you learn from you, and hopefully connect with you. Can we hear it for that, please? <laughs> Last but not least, our wonderful sport management department that gives us the privilege to be here right now. One more round of applause. All right, guys, the conference program is going to be available behind me uh, periodically coming up here. Um, you will be able to use that. Um, it will be your guide throughout the conference. Um, you can use it for your schedule when you'll be uh, able to attend the networking fair, where lunch will be, your speaker bios, all of it. Additionally, you want to follow us on social media. 
Follow us on Instagram, Snapchat, use our geotag that Brooke worked really hard to make back there. We're ashamed right here. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and lastly, Twitter. Um, guys, we are going to use that as our platform to ask all of our questions to our speakers. So make sure to use that. Um, tweet your questions at FSU Sport, and I will be up here and I will ask all your questions from you guys. And if you get the chance, you'll be able to engage with them as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Brandon Roth, our keynote speaker. He is in his 12th season with the Jacksonville Jaguars, and his fourth is the manager of football operations. In his current role, he manages the entirety of the team's travel, as well as their facilities, and prepares them for the ins and outs of every day, both in and out of season. A 2010 graduate from the FSU's Sport Administration Master's Program, he was also a member of FSU's baseball team under head coach Mike Martin and worked with facility and events as well as the memorabilia office which late with late coach Bobby Bowden where he worked on signing and distributing memorabilia from FSU Athletics. So without further ado, I give to you our keynote speaker, Mr. Brandon Roth. So I'm going to try to make this as interactive as possible. So, um, But no, when Dr. Pappas called me a couple, of, I guess a month ago or so, about coming here, and I remember he kind of reminds me that this has been 13 years since I've been here, so that was that's nice of you, thank you. Um, <laughs> but uh, this was always one of my favorite you know, weekends, you know, being able to hear so many people's stories about how they got to where they got to. Obviously, you guys are all in sport management, you guys all want to work in some, some way, shape, or form of sports. So hearing people's stories, how they got there, and, and what they're doing. You know, you may not know what you want to do right now. There's a lot of different avenues. It's constantly changing as well. So um, this is always a good opportunity to hear people that are doing possibly what you want to do. Um, so Dr. Pappas, thank you for the opportunity to come back and speak to everyone tonight. So um, a little bit about me, uh, my background. I was born and raised in Jacksonville. Anyone from Jacksonville here? We got a couple. All right, perfect. Um, you know, I played baseball and football in high school. Obviously, every baseball or every athlete in high school, the goal is to go pro. As you get older, you realize that's not going to happen. So, um, didn't play after that until I got. I'll get that later. Um, started undergrad. Got my undergrad in '09. Got my master's in sport administration in 2010. Um, got a little trivia question that some gifts to give out. So this might, uh, the upper, upper class and probably have a little bit better idea, but does anyone know who this is? You better know who that is. Masters of the game, four. Who is it? Thank you. So Brian Ford, he's the chief operating officer of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, I had the pleasure, he, he spoke here what, four or five years ago, Yeah. Um, so I had the pleasure of meeting him when I was doing training camp with the Buccaneers when I was in school. Uh, he's a guy, he's a mentor of mine, he's, I've stayed in contact with him the whole time, um, called him on the way over here, um, so great guy, FSU grad, so just to give you an idea of, you know, there's FSU grads everywhere. Uh, does anyone know who this is? Trevor Lawrence! <laughs> yeah. Well, I wasn't talking about Trevor, I was talking about this guy. You. That's right, there. You guys know it. So Alan, Alan Zucker, he, he's, the par he's a partner of Excel Sports Management. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him once we drafted Trevor last year. Uh, he does the marketing for, obviously, Trevor. He's done all the Mannings, Peyton, Archie, Eli, at the new NIL. He's starting to do stuff with Arch. He's in high school. Um, but he's also done Taylor Swift, Jim Nance, all over the board. So FSU grad, he spoke here, I think, three years ago. Um, another great guy. Uh, you know, so just to give you an idea, of, there's people all over FSU grads that are doing big things. So. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit about what I do. Um, does anyone know what football operations is? Nobody Shout it out. Knows. Shout it out. Anything? 
Go ahead. Maybe. You can say something. Yeah, uh, the day-to-day -day work of like just scheduling uh, football practices, training, uh, workouts. Anything else? Who else? I told you about participate. There you go. Here's one stand up. Introduce yeah. yourself. Uh, Absolutely. What's your name? Jaden Jones. Where are you from, Jaden? I am from Sarasota. Okay. Very cool. <laughs> See how it works? <laughs> Basically, you just say anything, and that's pretty much what we do. So I'm, I split it off between off season and end season, just to give you an idea. So. Where we're at now, uh, every off season there's some sort of staff changes. Um, in our situation, we haven't been winning many games, so we fired we fired our coach. Everyone heard of Black Monday? Oh, yeah, we didn't wait till that. We did it in December. So, uh, so we actually don't have a coach right now. But the first thing you do is you go through staff changes at the end of the season. If you're doing well, that means other teams with coach openings usually go out to your coordinator, so there's some sort of turnover every year. Um, another big thing that we're involved in is the facility renovations part. Uh, we can do small, we've done small things from a locker room renovation, meeting space, um, you know, scoreboards out on the practice field, wall pads, anything like that. And just to give you an idea, this is, this is our current practice field right now. Um, and our, our stadium is like right here. <laughs> So we're one of the six teams that currently operate out of our stadium. Um, but we just broke ground on a $150 million facility. It's going to be an 18-month build, and it's going to move all of our operation into these buildings right here. And we'll have our practice fields and indoor all right next to the stadium, but out of the stadium at the same time. So we've done small renovations, and now we're doing a huge one. Um, and so it's been pretty cool to be a small part of making decisions and stuff like that on the facility that's going to be here long past when I'm done with the team. So we got facility renovations, free agency visits. So free agency visits, that happens in March. Um, so we've gone January, February, now March. Uh, once the new league year starts in the middle of March, you know, we don't have anything to do with the, the contracts or anything like that, but once once we do sign guys, it's getting them to Jacksonville, their flights, their families, getting them acclimated, putting them up in a hotel until they find a place, getting them set up with realtors, um, car dealers, stuff like that. So um, as far as free agency visits, that's what we do. For draft visits, um, you know, we have, you guys have heard of pro days, right? So sending our coaches all across the country to these pro days to, to evaluate talent coming out in the draft. Um, and then as well as pre-draft visits, which with COVID, obviously a lot of things have changed the last couple of years. The pre-draft visits have been canceled, but prior to that, we would bring in 30 visitors, um, draft eligible players for that coming year, bring them through your, bring them through your facility, um, operate you know, the schedule, making sure they meet with their position coach, head coach, trainers, strength staff, player engagement, coordinating all those schedules for those visits. Um, throughout March and April. And then the vets return, uh, I'm just kind of going through the calendar. The vets return in April, um, so any guys that don't have housing, most guys live in Jacksonville, but the ones that don't, giving them housing and stuff for the off-season program. Um, and then after the draft, the rookies arrive, uh, get them set up at the hotel, and transportation to and from the facility. Then the, one of our biggest things is, as Dr. Pabst mentioned, the team travel part. So our schedule comes out in May. The, uh, our first road game is in August. So as you can maybe imagine, competing with weddings and corporate events that schedule way ahead of time, the challenges of finding a hotel with meeting space just a couple months prior to your visit. Um, but that's what the league wants, so that's what the league gets. Uh, so they, they schedule, they drop the schedule in uh, May and then we go right into locking in hotels, as well as uh, busing contracts and stuff like that. So, in season, starting in July, you know, we do train, we set up training camp. That's everything from the hotels to getting transportation, getting interns in. There's a lot of moving parts. Your roster's at 90. Your support staff is up probably with interns another 30. Um, so getting everyone 
all on board for that. The team travel aspect I kind of touched on. Um, then we get into, at this point, we get into the actual itineraries of planes, uh, buses, police escorts, equipment trucks, coordinating all of that in the visiting city. Um, I put player transactions and workouts in the end season, but this is more of a year-round thing. Like we, we actually had a workout yesterday, um, and I put that there because it's not like Madden where you know, you're just switching guys and switching names on the back of jerseys and stuff like that. Like, these are real people. These are people that have to travel from one place to another, uproot their families and come um, when a guy gets signed or, or go somewhere else when he gets cut and claimed by, some, by another team. So there, there's more into that than, you know, you might see the transaction ticker, but there's a lot that goes into that. Or if you see a you know, guy worked out somewhere, um, it, 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 it's more than just a name flashing on the bottom of the screen. Uh, then with practice, you know, we, we make sure the flow of practice is going well. Uh, we help out in drills, we get ran over, uh, you know, we, we do a little bit of, of all that. I haven't got hurt yet, so that's good. Um, facility upkeep, like I mentioned, we're one of six teams that work out of our stadium right now. Our stadium was, was finished in, uh, in 95, so imagine that as being one of the oldest stadiums in the league. Um, so with things breaking, leak issues, or if coach wants signs changed, uh, all sorts of different things. The guys, chair breaks, you know, th those are all things that you know, we just make sure that everything's up and running so that the day-to-day -day can go smoothly. Um, and speaking of day-to-day, -day, uh, obviously, I imagine there's some, a lot of different COVID protocols here. I think I've heard you guys have been pretty much virtual the last couple of years. Um, well, our, our COVID protocols have changed week to week, month to month, day by day. Um, so, and not just in Jacksonville, every city we go to, um, they, could, they could change at the drop of a, of a hat whether, you know, we could eat in the meal room or whether we have to do all to go. We, we just had to be really flexible with all that. Uh, making sure the guys have all their uh, contact tracers with them so that we can trace if there's any outbreaks or anything. So, um, the COVID part has been a big part of our day-to-day our -day, the last couple of years in season. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. Every team has to do it. So, um, by show of hands, does, every, does, anyone, does everyone know what they want to do in sports? If you do, raise your hand. All right. Good amount. Raise your hand if you know somebody in that field doing it right now. More than I thought. So zero. That's not the amount of classes I missed of uh, Dr. James, but um, <laughs> that's the amount of people I knew in sports when I got to school. Um, so let me set this the picture for you. I'm going into my junior year, going into the sport management program, knowing I want to work in sports, and I know nobody. That's, that's not a good feeling. Is anybody in that in those same shoes right now? Raise your hand if you're in those same shoes. Okay. Yeah. So what's, what's the best way to get out of those shoes? Networking. There we go. Get involved. You know, we're, you're at Florida State, you're at one of the top athletic uh, departments in the country. And there's great people everywhere at Florida State. So what I always tell people is, is get involved. When, when's the best time to get involved? Right now. Yep. <laughs> Good job. There. There you go. The best time is now. It doesn't matter if you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, grad school. You know, whenever you get the, the courage to do it, you know, get involved. I always tell people, get involved as early as possible. Get involved with as many different things as possible. Because you may not like the first thing you do. You might like the second thing you do. You may not. So try different things so that you can find out what you like and what you don't. So what I needed, what I realized I needed to do is I needed to get involved. Um, so these are some different things I did while I was in school. The first thing I did was going to my junior year, everyone familiar with federal work study? Mm -hmm. yes. So federal work study is basically financial aid, you just have to work for it. Um, so the first thing I did was I went through the athletic department and called the first person, didn't answer. Second person, didn't answer. I went down until somebody answered. 
And it's happened to be Carol Moore. Her last name is Air now. But she's been with the, uh, in the football office since 1985. She answered the phone, and it just so happened that the person running the memorabilia office had just quit the week before. And so she asked me if I wanted the job, and I was like, yeah, absolutely. So that was the first thing I did, was I, I worked in the memorabilia office. So I remember going in the first day, thinking, all right, you know, I've been in more. More is beautiful. More Athletic Center is amazing. I'm like, all right, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to be working in the football office. I'm going to be you know, meeting people left and right. This, this is going to be great. So I go up to Carol's office, and then we start going down the elevator. I'm like, okay, I guess we'll be on the first floor. Then we, then we kind of walk down a hallway to uh, past the training room. I'm like, all right, I guess, I guess I'm going to be over here. And then we walk out of Moore into underneath the stadium, and we start walking around the stadium. I'm like, where, where are we going? So if you're familiar with the stadium, there's some padlock storage sheds around different sections of the stadium. And so that's where my office was. It was, it was air conditioned, but it was nowhere that I thought I was going to be. And that was my first gig. People would bring stuff in for Coach Bowden to sign. He only, the only thing that he didn't sign, the only thing that he signed that wasn't personalized was stuff for charity. So um, what I would do is he brought a football to me. I write, you know, go Jim, or to Jimmy, draw a nice little spear on it, write, go Knowles, and then I take it up to him to sign it. So if you got anything in 09 or 08 uh, signed by Coach Bowden, the terrible chicken scratch was me. Uh, but yeah, so I'd take stuff up to him, he'd sign it, I'd bring it back down, ship it out if it needed to be shipped, or call people let them know. It was, so that was my first gig. Then I started. You know, then I met some people that were in athletic facilities and events. And then they said, yeah, like, come to a couple of events, you know, see how it goes. One of the guys is here now, Ryan Zorn. So, um, you know, we, we, I started working in facility events, um, helping out with soccer, softball, volleyball, um, occasionally football, but, but not really. Uh, that, was, that was few and far between, but a lot of the smaller events. Um, and it, it was cool. It kind of gave me a, a glimpse of, of the event life, and you know, putting on it was, more, it, was you know, it was just a different experience that I had. had. Um, then this this organization isn't around anymore, but uh, Garden and Gold Guides was a recruiting organization that helped with uh, recruits and uh, official visits and stuff like that. Well, Carol, who was my supervisor from the memorabilia office, she was in charge of the Garnet and Gold guides. So she pretty much told me, hey, you're going to do that. And I said, okay. Um, so yeah, that was cool to kind of get an idea of, of what the recruiting, obviously it's a lot different now, but what recruiting was like back then. Um, then I, uh, I always had that itch to continue baseball and uh, the baseball team had a need at bullpen catcher. So my senior year, I, I became a bullpen catcher on the baseball team. But more than, more than the playing part, uh, I got to see the operations side of traveling. Um, Chip Baker is a guy that I keep up with quite a bit. He's the director of baseball ops, and he's been there forever. Um, and so him and I, we'll, we'll bounce things off of each other, because him and I do a lot of the same things uh, travel-wise uh, and stuff like that. So. Um, you know, the, the travel and, and see kind of how he operates uh, it gave me that interest in that. Uh, and then um, in 2008, uh, I started working Tampa Bay Buccaneers training camps. So I worked three camps with the Bucks, 08, 09, and 10. And this, and this, there was 20 people my first year. And I always thought, man, how am I going to separate myself from these other 20 people? <coughs> I just worked. You know, you just do what you're asked. You know, don't ask too many questions. You just do what you ask. Keep your head down. Work hard. In 09 and 10, they asked me to come back. So, um, but that gave me a, a good idea of. That was like my first glimpse of the mm -hmm. NFL. So, uh, the things that getting involved help you. You know, you gain experience. You, you, and not just something to put on a resume. Personally, you get to find out whether it's something that you like or something that you don't like. Um, you know, you may not like ticket sales. If that's your first opportunity, it's an opportunity. You get to see that you don't like it. 
then you go into marketing. If, if you don't like marketing, maybe you go into sponsorship or operations or whatever. So um, the, more, the more you get involved, the more experience that you gain. Um, networking, you know, networking is huge. Networking is everything. You know, the more you do, the more people you meet. You can never meet too many people, uh, especially if they're doing something that you want to do. Um, so finding out how they got to where they got to, what keeps them there, you know, what, what helps them succeed, those are all things that, that are huge. Uh, there's, in my world, there's 32 NFL teams. 32. So if I got a call this past summer uh, from the guy with the, uh, the Bills up in Buffalo, he needed an, an intern for a month. And so there was, he asked me if I knew anybody, if I had anybody. You know, those conversations happen. Um, you know, we're really close with our, the guys in our division. We're really close with the Tennessee Titans, Indianapolis Colts, Houston Texans. Like, we all talk. We all, you know, if there's a guy that worked for one team and he's applying to another one, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to call the team that you just worked for. So networking, it, it's huge. Those, the more you do, the more doors that get open. You know, if you just, you know, and, and I hate to say it, but if you just go to school and, and just, don't get involved. There's not doors aren't just gonna throw themselves open for you. Like you gotta you gotta work for it. You gotta go and put yourself out there and, and get those doors open. And it, it also helps you build leadership. It steps it gets you to step out of your comfort zone. Uh, and, and so building leadership it, it's it's only gonna help you in the long run. Uh, and so uh, and I'm not saying don't have fun. Obviously you're in college, you know, but. For example, tonight, you guys chose to be here. You guys could have been at Pop Ballet's, Johnny's, you guys could have been anywhere. So, I think those are still around. <laughs> um, but you guys chose to be here. That, that's showing that your priorities are straight. Because um, that, that's what it's all about. So, this, this next number, I'm going to have a couple numbers as we go through. This next number is eight. And this is the amount of, okay, I've been, I just finished my 12th season. We're about to hire our eighth coach since I've been there. Oh, six. I counted interim coaches. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. No. Okay. Because <laughs> if they're head, if they're any other head coach in the title, they're a head coach. Uh, so this is another interactive one. I don't know how many Jacksonville fans are in here, but if you know the name, shout it out. So Jack was our coach in 2010. He got let go with five games left in 2011. Mel Tucker took over. Doug Peterson. Michael Larkey. Who said Malarkey? Me. That's a good one. I said it. Entertainment industry. People like to be entertained when they're not working. 
That's why in every uh, every TeamWorks application that you apply to, if it's for a team, it says ability to work nights and weekends. During the season, once training camp starts, I see people at work more than I see my family, more than I see my son. So you want to be around people that are good people. You know, you spend most of your time with them, year, you know, day in and day out, and traveling and stuff like that. You know. You're going to be tolerated until you until you get replaced if, if you're not a good person. Um, so, like I said, relationships are everything. I've worked with eight head coaches. Well, we'll be eight. Th those staffs, there's been four or five complete staffing changes. Those guys have all gone on to different teams. There's two guys that were assistant coaches on our staff that just got head coaching jobs in the last two years. Robert Solomon at the Jets, Nathaniel Hackett at the Broncos. Those are great guys. You know, I could call them on my phone right now. They're, they're great people. But they were assistant coaches, you know, when when they were uh, with us. If I treated them any differently than I treated a head coach, they, we probably wouldn't have the, the same relationship that we do. Um, I, I say leadership again. You know, you might ask like, how how can you be a how can I show my leadership if I'm not in charge of anybody? Well, the first thing you got to do to be a good leader is to, to lead yourself. Be on time. Be organized. You know, be reliable. Be accountable. You know, those are all things that you can control, um, and and they're they're huge. You know, and, and my biggest thing here is, you know, how do you treat people that can't help you? It's it's easy. It's easy to to you know treat your boss with respect or to treat people in power and, and management. You know, upper management. You know, but how do you how do you treat the intern? Uh, you know, the strength intern that's only there for two weeks, or how do you treat the marketing person that you just happen to be work, walking into the facility with one time, one morning, and then you don't see him for two months, you know, if, if, if you're a jerk or anything like that, then, then they're going to know that, and that's going to, that perception is going to be the reality for them, because you, you don't deal with them day to day. So those, those are all things um, that I find that are important. Um, now, I, I take it a little differently with players. Players are a different breed. Um, and, and, and you'll understand why in a minute. You know, how do you treat your star quarterback versus your 90th man? Uh, Jimmy Johnson came and, and talked to us this, tra this past training camp. And he said, you, know, you treat everyone fairly, but not the same. Uh, and, and his story was, and he, he had just got they had just got done with the training camp practice. He was having a team meeting, and there was there was a, a lower roster special teams guy who kept nodding off in his meeting. He kept nodding off, nodding off, he, and he was talking, and he, he kept getting you know fed up. And finally, he woke him up and said, you know, go get your release papers. You're out of here. That he was asked, what if it was Troy Aikman? He said he would have tapped him on the shoulder, told him to wake up. So you know, <laughs> so you know. I say all that to tell you, you know, when you're dealing with people that you work with, you know, treat treat everyone with respect, um, and and it'll it'll, it'll help you out. Uh, one thing that Gus Bradley always told us was, you know, you're you're everyone's human. You know, you're gonna have good days, you're gonna have bad days, you're gonna have days that you just don't, you're just not on, you don't you don't want to be around people or anything like, or something like that. Gus Bradley always told us if you can come up with a personal statement. It can always draw you back. Then you know it, it, it can do nothing but help you. So once he told us that in a meeting, I came up with a personal statement that, that I thought would always draw me back. And so it's to get the job done under any circumstance while keeping a genuine appreciation for all involved. Did anyone, did anyone guess what the key word in, the, in this is? <coughs> That's right, genuine. You can tell when people are fake, right? So genuine is genuine is key. Um, you know, and like I said, it's, it's you're not always gonna gonna be on your best day. You're not always gonna have your best days, but always have something to to balance you out. And the third thing to get you know with sports and everything is sometimes you just gotta get lucky. You know, there has to be some sort of luck involved. Um, and so, a couple of different ways is, is out of coincidence. You know, this number one right here, this, this represents the amount of interviews it took me to get to my job right now. And it wasn't with the Jaguars. 
it was my first interview with the Bucks in 08. Um, and uh, many of you guys applied to jobs on Teamworks. I think there's LinkedIn applications now too. LinkedIn wasn't around when I was in school. Um, but Teamworks, you guys shotgun resumes and applications and all that. And you might hear back, and, but you probably won't. Um, so that's what I did. There was a training camp assistant job open for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So I s applied. A few weeks later, I got a call. I was like, man, they must have really liked my resume. You know, I did some things at FSU, blah, blah, blah. Went down for an interview, got the job. Turns out when I got there, uh, there was an intern named Jelani Downing that was going through the resumes. You know, when you post a job like that on, on Teamworks, they get eight, 900 resumes. I was like, man, you know, he's picking out of eight or 900 people. And then come to find out, you know, his dad lives in Jacksonville, and he went to school at FAMU. So because my resume said that I was from Jacksonville, and I went to school in Tallahassee, that's how I got pulled out of the stack. So sometimes it's not about, you know, what, you know, sometimes it just takes luck. And like I said, I'm not talking about, like, win the lottery luck. Like that, you know, you got to prepare for it, too. Um, sometimes it's about being at the right place at the right time. Um, I told you about when I worked in a storage shed for the memorabilia office. Well, for me to go get water, go, go see my supervisor, go mail stuff out, I had to walk through the stadium and through the, the locker room into the Moore Athletic Center. So I was walking back to, back to my office, and it just so happened to be during FSU's Pro Day. And the Pro Day was held on the field, and as I was walking, I saw what looked like a large individual coming my way and as I got closer I saw he had a Jaguar on his logo on a Jaguar logo on his shirt and does anyone know who coach Tom Williams is yeah I didn't know him either um, but I met him that day because as we got closer I stopped him and he was lost and I was just going where I needed to go and from that point on he got me in touch with uh, a guy in our front office with the Jaguars um, and I stayed with him for a couple of years trying to get internships or whatever and then he finally called me and the rest was history. But that's you know, right place at the right time. Had I not been involved, had I not been working that gig with the memorabilia office, had I said, ah, oh, this is, you know, I don't want to do this, like, this, this isn't glorious, like, you know, that opportunity may have never come. It probably wouldn't have ever come, but because I did, you know, I was, I was working that job. It just so happened right place at the right time. You know, organizational circumstances. I told you when I called Carol, you know, the person had just quit the week before. So she didn't even interview me. She just gave me the job. Like, you could be working at a place, you could have a season-long internship somewhere, and so an opportunity or an opening happens while you're there. That's great. That You're already there. It's an easy hire. So... Organizational, organizational circumstances happen as well, but you have to prepare. You know, you have to do the, you have to do your job as far as getting involved, getting that opportunity, because they're not just going to come at you. You know, this isn't law school where you know once you apply, from, you know, or once you get done and you pass the bar, all these jobs come at you. You have to go get them. You have to go find them, and so, um, and so that you're not just going to get handed a job pretty much. Um, and so, you guys are in a great spot here at Florida State. This is, like I said earlier, this is one of the, the best athletic institutions. You got Dr. Pappas here that goes way above and beyond to, to search for opportunities for you guys. And uh, and it, it's it's great. And I wish he was here when I was here, you know, because he makes it a lot easier. Um, and then you're going you're gonna to see a lot of speakers from different different places this, this next couple days. They could have all been up here tonight, but they're all, they're, you can take something from each one of them. You know, they're, they're, where they're, they're what they're doing, for, they're doing what they're doing for a reason. They're here talking to you guys, taking their time to, uh, to hopefully help you out. And so if anything else, uh, if there was, you know, hopefully I gave you guys some hope as far as, you know, you may not, you don't need to necessarily know somebody. Um, knowing people is great. If you'd already know someone in your field of work that you want to that you want to do, that's great. But you know, if you don't know anybody, it's not the end of the world. You know, you, you can make it happen. And with that.
Biggest challenge has, has been, you know, each each person that comes in, of, you know, whether it be a GM or a head coach, they all have their way of wanting to do things. So you get in the habit of how previous coaches and GMs want things done, and then you just, you just have to be adaptable. You have to, you can't just say, well, this is how we've always done it, because that doesn't mean it's always the, the best way to do it. Um, so that's that's one of the biggest things, just being adaptable to. Uh, to what the different coaches and the different the people in charge want to do, how they want to do things. Oh, yeah. All right, and I'm kind of building on that. This one's from Jack Jennings. How did you go about gaining the trust of the new hires, head coaches, staffs, um, while sticking to getting the job done? When I said, uh, one of the things I said earlier was, you know, being reliable is, is, is important. So once a new staff comes in and, and we start spending time uh, getting them acclimated and stuff like that, um, we, we gain their trust that way just from those initial interactions. Um, and, and then they become, re become reliable for them as they get uh, introduced into a new city, a whole new lifestyle essentially. Um, with a new team and stuff like that, so um, becoming reliable, um, I would say, is probably the, the biggest thing. And one from Naaman Smith here, when a new head coach is hired, how do you immediately introduce yourself and start building that relationship? So once a, once a new head coach comes in, and just speaking from my role, um, is as soon as a new head coach comes in, we start bringing in his staff. So guys that he knows he wants to hire, or guys that he wants to interview. Um, and so, to be honest with you, it happens organically, um, just from the amount of time that we're in the building getting his interviewees to and from different parts of the interview, or getting his, uh, his different uh, assistant coaches settled in. Um, it, it just happens organically just with, with being there, the amount of time that we are before the staff gets uh, settled. And when you're preparing for an international game, such as in London, how does that change from maybe just a regular away game? And that question is from David, whose last name I don't have. Perfect, David. Uh, that's actually a good question because you know we are London's team, uh, so we've uh, we've played eight games over there. Um, the only we started in 2013, and we've played every year over there except for 2020. Um, the the biggest the biggest difference between a domestic game and an international game is you have a lot of leeway with domestic games. Um, you don't have to deal with customs. You don't have to deal with passports. Um, you don't have to deal with uh, different country uh, ways of doing things. So um, one of my biggest responsibilities is making sure everyone has a valid passport. Um, and so that might sound easy, but players lose things, coaches lose things. 
they, they're used to traveling domestically where you don't even, for us, you don't even need an ID. You know, you, you just get screened. If you don't have your ID, you go through the screen line, you hop on the plane. So setting that expectation of it's not the same. Guys that have traveled with us quite a few times to London know the guys that are new to our team and haven't traveled internationally, that's probably the, the, the biggest thing is it's, it's such a different style. Like we don't have the leeway that we do. Passports, you gotta have a passport. Um, and stuff like that, so. What is the most interesting or difficult aspect of maintaining and working on the stadium with it being one of the oldest in the NFL? And that's from Reese Fishback. Yeah, so one of the most difficult aspects is us knowing it's old, but uh, when a new staff comes in, they're used to, they have a different expectation of where they've been. Um, you know, they, they could be coming from a newer facility, and so if a guy's in, a, in an office and he, he starts getting mad because there's a leak going on, um, you know, the, it's, it's those type of things, so like, you know, Things that come with older buildings, um, you know, things breaking, leaks, just different things like that. Um, we've we've tried to, you know, put lipstick on a pig for you know lack of a better way of putting it, but we're still in 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 the bottom of a stadium, and so things happen like they they'll pressure wash up top, you know, getting ready for a game or after a game and. That water will just seep through. It's not even raining outside, and guys are like, why is it? Why is it leaking in my office? Why is this leaking in the hallway? And so there's there's just different things like that that cause challenges with with being in an old stadium. You can only move. And then as we get bigger staffs, um, our stadium was like I said, built in '95. Staffs have grown double since then. So and, and especially with you know the analytics and, and different things like that, they're just constantly growing. Uh, sport performance, athletic training, all that stuff has grown in importance since '95. Um, so the the amount of staff, you can only move so many walls to make offices. Eventually, you tap out, and so finding space in an older building it, for people to to work is is also challenging. With that said, Billy August is wondering how much are you involved in the process of the new renovations? Uh, so. With the new the new renovations, uh, I'm involved in the parts that I control um, during like practice. So like I picked out the, the the clocks that we're using, the locations that they're going to be, um, and stuff like that. So a lot a lot of it is done at a higher level, um, but some of the, the operations parts of that that's that's where I come in and. Um, <coughs> You know, I've been able to voice different things as far as the layouts and everything like that. Um, but as far as things that I'm in charge of, it's it's most of the clocks and the operation of, of how we how we do that stuff in practice. And some people are wondering some more personal questions. Peyton Stevens wondering where have you seen the biggest growth in yourself over working uh, over your time working in Jacksonville, both personally and professionally. Right. So. Um, So if when I first started working with the Jags, like uh, you know, I thought that you know that's kind of how I identified myself as I work for the Jags. But then as as I grow older and I got married and now I have a, a son, you know, I I less identify myself with that versus what I do. And so at some point in your career, you know, you'll be able to separate the two and not be identified by what you do, um, you know. It's it's fun. I, I still I love what I do. I don't want to take that away. But then you know, and I, I worked hard to get there. But then eventually, you know, you realize that you know what's important as far as like family and stuff like that. And so, um, I'm, not to take away from the importance of you know why we're here tonight. But at some point, you you become more than the job. You know, more than it's not it's not just who you are. And Alyssa Lasaro is wondering what your personal goals are for your current position, and if you ever get complacent, and how you overcome that. Right. So I'll, I'll answer the second part first. Um, it's it's been difficult to, to get complacent just because you know the challenges. There, there's more. There's different challenges every time with different things. You know, whether it be 
um, you know, trying to get 90 guys in on a, you know, on separate flights for for training camp, or in, it seems to always happen every time we have a mass travel day. It's the worst weather in Jacksonville, so you got flight delays and stuff like that. So that there's, you know, we had a guy last year driving in, and he got in an accident on I-10, and he couldn't drive his car. So getting him a car service from Sapola, Florida, uh, which didn't even know where that was, uh, to Jacksonville within an hour, you know, so like different things like that pop up to keep, you know, to keep the challenges, to keep the challenges going. And what was the first part of that question? Um, with your personal goals, what they are and how they evolve. Right, so uh, personal goals are uh, obviously when I started and, and even now, it's always to, to gain more responsibility. Um, and, and I feel like I, I've achieved a good part of that. There's always room to grow. There's always room to do more. Um, but it was always to, to gain the trust to get, not just to be handed more responsibility, is to earn it. And so that's kind of where I'm at now is just, just to, to continue earning um, you know, more, more responsibility. Trevor Anderson's wondering, kind of on that note, how do you organize the many demands involved with working football operations? Right, so uh, one of the things that I feel helped me is I'm, I'm able to, you know, think about the individual tasks as opposed to everything that needs to get done. Being able to compartmentalize and prioritize what needs to get done when. You know, if there's something that doesn't need to get done for a couple of days, and there's more pressing things that need to get done, I, I can't. I don't need to worry about those that need to get done in a couple of days. I need to worry more about what's going on now. And so those are some things that that have kind of helped me. And you know, even having like checklists of you know for like an away game or something like that, when I need to do what, uh, when I need to contact police escorts, when we need to get our hotel specs and our uh, rooming lists sent in. Um, and so those are just different things like checklists are great, spreadsheets are great. Those are really help me stay organized and, uh, and help me stay on top of things. And Gabby Soares, I believe, wondering um, how many people would you say work in the same or similar position with you at the Jaguars and if you kind of delegate those responsibilities um, of those everyday tasks? Right, so uh, we have a department of four. Um, we have our, our director who's um, become more involved with facilities, the renovation and stuff like that. Uh, we have myself and my counterpart um, who handle most of the, the travel and logistics of, of everything. And then we have um, a guy under us who also handles mostly facilities, like the maintenance calls and, and stuff like that. Being at an old stadium, there's a lot. It's a required a full-time job. <laughs> so. Um, so there's there's four of us in there, and um, and I am actually fortunate enough to where I work with one of my best friends I grew up with. I grew up with, um, and we've worked together since uh, 2010. We shared an office and everything. We grew up playing baseball together uh, from seventh grade on. So uh, we work. Needless to say, we we work really well with each other as far as juggling tasks and, and stuff like that. Right, so um, so, and every every team is different um, with when they take on interns for our like for our department specifically in operations, um, because we have a four four people on our team, you know we're, we don't have the luxury of, of having a year long intern, um, but we typically and obviously COVID has changed a lot of things the last couple of years, but typically we're able to bring in. Um, three to four uh, that summer, and, and I say that, but every time we have a regime change, you know, there's a lot of people that have favors. Um, so like when we when we changed ownership, you know, we didn't pick interns for three years. They were handed to us. Said, hey, this guy's working with you this summer. Hey, this guy's working with you. So that does happen. I don't want to act like it doesn't. So that does happen. But when we are able to pick interns. Um, you know, it, it's it's great to be able to give people that have earned it the response, you know, some some experience and responsibility. And um, 
Jaden Jones is wondering when hiring, um, when you're able to, um, what's the first thing that you look at on the resume? Uh, the first, the first thing I look at is, is you know, how they spent their time in college. You know, it's, you know, it's not the GPA. You know, sorry if anyone's <laughs> offended by that. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily, you know, where they went to school. Although Florida State usually sparks my interest, um, but it's, you know, what did they do? Were they, you know, did they, did they, you know, get involved? Did they network? Did they do things like that of that nature? You know, who are their, who, who. Do they have as their recommendations, you know, and what positions they are. You know, if, if, if you were a bartender for four years and the owner of the bar is your recommendation, then, I mean, no, no, nothing against it, but it, that, that's not going to spark, you know, our, our eye of, as far as, you know, as far as a possible candidate. Um, but I would say how you spent your time and, and, like I said, have fun in college, but also, you know, have your priorities straight too of if you want to work in sports, you definitely, you know, want to get involved. And John, so I was wondering what innovative projects or ideas for projects have you been able to work on um, that have helped the Jaguar stand out as an organization? Mm -hmm. uh, wh whoever asked that question, can you ex uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, so just working at football ops, like, you know, your day-to-day, -day, um, you talk about how you get to redesign the facilities, just sort of projects like that or ideas that you've worked on, what do you think has made football operations Right. Um, I, mean, I think I think we've done uh, as far. As, I think we've done the best that we could with with you know the resources that we've been given, uh, and obviously the, this new facility is going to be able to help us enhance that. Um, you know, we try and make it not feel like you're in the bowels of a stadium. Um, we've uh, and, and things so. Like, but there's only so much you can do with that, um, and I feel like we've. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the, the app of Teamworks, but we've been able to utilize that to really enhance our communication um, to make sure that everyone is, is up to speed on what's going on. Kylie Brennan is wondering, how do you professionally handle conflict that arises between players and head coaches, especially you know, with kind of the ever-shifting environment? What a timing question about the conflict with head coaches. Um, <laughs> So, conflict between players and head coaches uh, typically don't involve uh, me specifically. Um, but when you're in a toxic environment, it's the way I try and deal with it is to just you know, you know be as be as calm and sensitive to the situation as possible. You know, if if, if you know guys aren't getting along, you know, don't don't. You know, spread that fire at all. You know, be be the calm voice, be the you know voice of reason. You know, and and just don't get it, let it go any further. Um, but as far as specific, you know, coach to player conflicts, um, I, I stay out of those. Um, on a lighter note, what is the uh, best advice you've ever received? As far as like uh, people that work for you. It's a good question. Just play it. Yeah, that's that's me. Yes, it is for people that work for you or people that you will hire eventually. Right. So uh, I, I think you, the first thing you have to be as self aware of what your leadership style is. Um, I'm I'm more of a lead by example, uh, whereas my counterpart J.K. it works out well that he's more um, he's more uh, able to voice ways to do things, um, and so I think it. Balance, we balance each other out in that aspect where you know, we've had uh, interns that have been with us that have you know, complimented us both on how we go about our way of doing things. You know, he's more vocal, I'm, more, I'm a better doer than a teacher, um, but in doing that, they were able to learn from me as well. And um, FSU Jessica 2011 is wondering um, what your most challenging task in an out of state uh, one of my most challenging tasks uh, in season is, is the whole passport situation. Um, you know, cause, you know, we start collecting those right after the final roster is picked, and we, you know, as we bring guys in for workouts or we claim guys, you know, 
we make sure that they have passports, and if they don't, we try and we, we get them one as soon as possible. Uh, there's been situations where we've we've claimed a guy or picked up a guy who didn't have a passport, and we're leaving in three days. So I go up to Atlanta, I get him a passport, and I come back down. So it's um, so I can't be the that can't be an excuse of why a guy couldn't go to to play in a game like. If, it's eventually going to fall on me, uh, so you just got to gotta roll with it. Um, in the off season, I would say that the biggest the biggest challenges are, um, are, I mean, lately it's been for us, you know, figuring out what the new staff wants. <laughs> um, once we, so that's unfortunately that's been a couple of years, you know, three of the last four years or so. Nico is wondering if you can walk us through a normal game day. From from my perspective, so game day is probably like a home game. I should say is probably the best day for me all week um, because you know we stay at a hotel the night before. So on game day, wake up. There's a pregame meal, and guys get in their cars, drive to the stadium. My main responsibilities once we leave the hotel are. I'm on standby until kickoff, and then if you see the tablets on the sidelines, um, I'm responsible for those, uh, getting those to the coaches after after possessions, and so that's like the most stressful thing for me on a game day, and that's not even stressful. Um, you know, usually it's the guys getting too into the game, and it's he's like, this isn't working, this isn't working. It's really just hitting a button, and it's working all of a sudden. So, um, but no, home games are are great. I love home games. Away games is a, is a lot different because you know you're you're on it the whole time. Uh, you know you got pregame meal, you got buses departing with police escorts, so making sure that all of that is coordinated properly. Um, then uh, making sure guys are on time. You know that, that's one of those you know, treat everyone fairly but not the same. If if Trevor's happened to be running a few minutes late for the bus, you know we have to hold the bus. If player number 53 is, you know, running a few minutes late, that bus is gone. He's, he's hopping on the next one. So, um, so just making sure that, you know, everything is, is good with that. And then post-game, um, you know, we have TSA screening. And then, uh, then obviously the arrival when we get back to Jack's, making sure we have buses to take us back to our cars. Wyatt Dossie's wondering, in all your time there, what was the coolest football moment you got to witness? So, just finished my 12th season. We had one. We've had one winning season so far, uh, and that was in 2017. So, that that whole year was probably the coolest experience I've ever had. We, you know, we started out three and three, and we won four in a row, clinched the division, clinched the playoff spot. Um, played a really terrible game against. A, against the Bills in the week one of the playoffs, beat them, went to Pittsburgh, nobody gave us a shot. We, we put 45 on them and then then uh, we went to New England for the AFC title game. And that atmosphere and that experience was, was by far you know, the, the best that I've had since I've been there. Now I've had this question kind of pop up a lot so I'm not gonna credit um, or shout everybody out but what is what are some things that you do to balance your personal life as well as your extremely demanding job? Right, um, and, and that's one of those things that uh, I've kind of grown. I've been able to do it as I've grown, and um, is being able to to know when when things need to get done. Um, do I need to stay all night to get things done, or can I? Go home and do things the next day, or can I go home for you know spend time with my son before he goes to bed, and then do some things once he goes to bed. So just being able to to separate and prioritize and, and stay organized that way that's that's been able to help me um, grow personally as far as um, being able to separate the job from family. Derek was wondering what do you feel is the most rewarding part of your lasting career with the same organization. Right. Uh, so, 
being born and raised in Jacksonville, I've always had that vested interest in the team and in the and, and hoping for the success of the team. Um, the most rewarding part is, you know, it's whether it be a, you know getting back from a, a London game and knowing that we just knocked it out of the park as far as logistically, uh, or getting through a, a whole COVID season without having to miss any games or have any games get delayed um, and, and things like that. So I, I speak of it as more of like a, a, a whole, um, and those, those are the, the rewarding parts um, for me. And kind of building off that, Caitlin Wilkie's wondering how that compares to the downsides of the job and what those are. Uh, I mean, the, the downsides are, you know, it's, it's an entertainment business, and it's, it's a pretty cutthroat at that. So, um, you know, being a part of so many uh, regime changes and coaching changes and stuff, you get close to people, you build relationships, even with players, you build relationships with these people, and then all of a sudden, you know, the business part takes over, and guys get cut, or guys get traded, or guys get fired. And so, those th that's the hardest part is, is and that's why I mentioned earlier, like it's not just a transaction on a, on a piece of paper, it's, you know, those are people's lives, families, and people that you get close with by spending so much time with, and then all of a sudden, if you have a bad year, then you just flip it all around. So th that, that's probably the hardest part, is, is the personal side and the personal connection uh, with both players, coaches, and staff. Tyler Pittman's wondering, after everything went on with Brian Flores, how you believe the, uh, the Jags will move forward to ensure that there's equality in hiring? That is a, uh, since I'm not involved in the hiring, that is way above my pay grade. Um, I mean, I, I think with, any, with anything, uh, you know, it goes back to being respectful and, and being a good person and, and doing things the right way, um, giving people equal opportunities to, to coach or to be GMs and, and, and everything. So I'm more of a, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, color, it's, it's who's the best for the job, who fits your organization the best, um, and whether, you know, how that's gonna change or, you know, what impact I have on that. I, I have very little impact on that. Um, but that's that's my approach is it doesn't matter who you are, as long as you, you know, hopefully you do the, the right job, so. And um, building off that a little bit, Mary Sullivan Dallas is wondering if you feel that women face a unique set of professional challenges in the sports world with getting a foot in the door or obtaining job promotion, and um, you know how you guys work with that. Yeah. I mean, I absolutely think that there's there's challenges and there's there's you know room for growth as far as um, you know, women in sports and, and more so women on the football side of sports or even um, any. Uh, sport that's out there. Um, football specifically, uh, I think we've made strides. Um, you know, we've had, uh, there's been women that have uh, gotten GM interviews, there's been women head coaches, or not head coaches, but assistant coaches. Um, you know, so I think in the past few years there's definitely been strides. You would have never thought ten years ago that there would be, you know, a running backs coach for the 49ers. It's, it's a woman or a yeah, chief of staff for an entire coaching staff in Cleveland who's a woman. Um, and so you, you've seen growth. Obviously, there, there's a lot more that needs to happen and uh, a lot more opportunities that need to be given. But you know, I definitely think there's heading, heading in the right direction. Yeah, so um, the, the, bills, uh, the bills have... Um, Jill, and then the uh, the Ravens have a lady named Joan. Uh, the both uh, the the Rams. Um, I'm, I'm spacing on her name, but the the head. Uh, so when Bruce Warwick left the Rams, um, I want to say that the person that took over for him, her name is Zoe. So there's there's definitely women uh, in operations. More lighthearted questions for our last couple minutes. Chris is wondering, 
What's with the stadium pool? Whose idea was that? And how much of a safety risk and <laughs> nuisance is it? <laughs> so, uh, so that was, I believe that came from our owner. Our owner, uh, if you don't know who he is, the name is Shad Khan. Um, and he's like the epitome of the American dream, came over from Pakistan. Um, I could give you his whole story, but basically he's top 60 on Forbes now. Um, and he also likes to have a good time, so he thought that, you know, what, how can you separate your, the experience in Jacksonville from other experiences, put pools in there. You can't put pools in Green Bay, so uh, you can do it in Florida. <laughs> And I have a couple more lighthearted questions, but I do uh, see this one from Miles Ken, and I think it's important. Um, do you have any advice for international students who want to apply for the same position in the NFL? We uh, we've actually had uh, some you know people like we've had a guy from Australia who was a strength coach of ours. He actually came from Florida State. His name's Alex Hampton um, a few years back, but. Um, I mean, there, we've going over to London. There's definitely parallels to operations there and here. We, uh, when we, when our owner first bought the Fulham Soccer Club, uh, Fulham Football Club over in London, um, you know, they would they would come over and we would bounce it. You know, ways that they do things um, and ways that we do things, so that you know we can see. Oh, we, we like that, we like that. So um, bridging the gap between international and domestic. Um, I think, I think there is a way to do that. I just don't have a great answer for that. <laughs> Jordan Walton's wondering who you're drafting number one. The best player. <laughs> it was a little, a little easier to answer last year. Um, Sam Sheeta is wondering, did you ever eat bologna sandwiches with Thousand Island? I have not had a bologna sandwich since I was probably in like third grade, so, um, but he loved them and we gave them to him, so. And I was like, I think that wraps up my questions. Like, guys, I did my, my very best to get to them all, um, but they, for the method, if we were wondering if it works, it works. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for tweeting and for asking all these questions. It was so awesome. Everybody give it up for Mr. Brandon. Thank you.